haven't written in a while because we haven't done a lot to write about until recently. We hit a guy, I don't remember his name. He was a member of the same bunch that hit the World Trade Center. He had a beard that was long and dyed red. We eased up, and as I was putting the charge on his door, he opened the door. We cleared the house and took him with us. Then in a few days, I was sitting outside talking to my son on satellite phone. When a rocket hit a wall about 50 yards from me, I haven't read these things uh, since I wrote it, you know, because it's just a lot to sit down and digest, and and it, it brings it all back. It brings back the heat and the and the, just that time of the war. I grew up, I mean, honestly, you watch Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, John Rambo. I thought, wow, that's what I want to be like that guy. Move, move, get down in the mud. I'd noticed an article in Parade Magazine. It was an old magazine that would come out in a newspaper and it had on the front of it these muddy guys and it said, are these the toughest men in the world? Uh, and it was Navy SEALs, you know, and I never even heard of them. And I read the article, I got to studying it. And I brought it up to the recruiters, and of course the Navy guy's like, I don't know what the what, do you want to be a nuke, uh, you know, on a nuclear submarine? I'm like, no, I want to be, I, I like to talk about being a SEAL. And of course he gave me some pretty poor advice, uh, uh, how to train to be a Navy SEAL. He goes, you go out and cut a big log about this big, and and then you carry that thing up and down hills and stuff where you live, and, and you'll be ready. And I was like, okay. Watching my dad work from daylight till dark taught me the value of hard work and dedication, and it really taught me to be prepared for like situations like Bud's. I think you're about 17. Us not knowing what you about the Navy SEALs, but we did know that you had read all about it, you knew all about it, and you, know, you knew what it would take to get it done. So we'd, I'd have people asking me, why are you carrying a log up and down the highway? Yeah. And, and at that time, we weren't aware about the SEALs. We just didn't realize what all you had to go through. Well, I remember showing you a picture of uh, one of them carrying a boat motor or something, and you're like, well, you better uh, get an education. That guy don't look like he's very smart. <laughs> <laughs> I think your goal was you, was you really was prepared for it. Yeah. If you hadn't been prepared for it, it might have been, it'd been a lot harder. Well, it's all mental. Yeah. Anything's mental. That's the part, you know, your military's great, but to turn out to be a uh, turn out to be a good person, that impresses me more. Uh, uh, you know, uh, y'all instilled a lot in me, and so I, that's probably where it all came from. Well, so you probably caused a few gray hairs once we found out what it was all about. <laughs> I didn't just prepare by carrying a log around. I had a buddy who I played baseball and football with in high school, and he had a swimming pool in his backyard, and he actually taught me really how to swim. Been a while since we've been here. It has been a while. A lot of time on this field right here. Remember that game at East High? Where, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sandy. Yeah, how's it? That big, big, that running, big back. running back they had, yeah. yeah. When we ran him out on the edge there. We gave him the good news. We did. Talking about swimming, you remember you diving in that pool? Ooh, cracked my head on the bottom. <laughs> you bounced completely out, out of the water. water. Well, Randall was right there, and I and I come up. Yeah. And I said, I think I hit my head. <laughs> he's, he was blood, blood running down coming face. everywhere. And uh, he looks at it and he goes, Oh, you'll be all right. <laughs> hey, a lot of good memories right here. Yeah, we we had a good time. We really did. So from 1989 to 1992, I was assigned to SEAL Team 8. 
We had deployed where we conducted reconnaissance and sniper missions. In 1992, I was asked to screen for Naval Special Warfare Development Group. I was selected and made it and was a salter and a sniper. You go in and deal with terrorists. I mean, that's your job, you know, in buildings and wherever they're at. We weren't like going to war like all the time, you know, it was just like we do a mission once a year. And by this time, I've got a couple kids. If you're going to war, it's one thing, but if you're going skydiving for three weeks in Arizona, I just, I was like, it's not my thing. And so I separated, you know, and so that I could be at home more. And I, I became a game warden in North Carolina. I was a, a wildlife officer for five years. I was in Henderson County, Montgomery County, and I came back to my home county here in Wilkes in 2001. I mean, honestly, I had a, a really good run as a wildlife officer, and I would have still been a wildlife officer if it hadn't been for 9-11. Definitely an eye-opening moment for me. The feeling of, I just want to do something. That, for me, it was like, okay, this is when I should be in. You know, I mean, I got out because we weren't at war. We're at war, I'm going back. I was on the phone probably within three days after 9-11, and I'd call back Dev Group. I called a buddy of mine who was still there, and I, I was like, hey, I said, look, I want to come back, you know? And he said, okay, cool. Go back through green team, the whole nine yards, you know? And I was just like, eh, all right, you know, I'll do it, you know? But my friend uh, that I was talking to, he was with the Army Special Mission Unit in uh, uh, Somali and Black Hawk Down. He was one of the four SEALs that were there. He goes, you should go try out for the Army Special Mission Unit. He goes, you're good at that kind of stuff. You know, and I'm like, what? You know, we're SEALs. And uh, he's like, he ain't fast smoking army guys. I called the recruiter and the recruiter's like, uh, okay, uh, well, what unit are you in? You know, and I'm like, well, I'm not in a unit. I'm a wildlife officer in North Carolina. And he goes, well, son, you gotta be in the military. You know, so I'm like, okay. So I drive down to the local National Guard unit the next day and I'm like, What's the least time I can sign up here, you know? And they're like, well, we, got, we have a special year enlistment, you know? And I'm like, that's me, sign me up. Go back home the next day, I call that recruiter back. I'm like, hey, I'm in the military. He's like, really? And I'm like, yeah. So I'm in the National Guard here in my home county. I get through selection and then I end up getting through OTC, which is operator training course. And I, I get out of that and then we invade Iraq. do a desert mobility, a couple thousand kilometers is one of the longest desert mobility since World War II. Basically, you know, causing diversions and making the Iraqis think that there would be an attack. They thought it was an army and it was 60 of us. You know, they were creating havoc. Every mission you're in a close, close combat with somebody, whether it's with your hands or with weapons. So it's a, it's a constant, uh, hey, it's a fight. When you go through that door, it's a, it's a fight with whoever's in that house. Our mission was basically, we had paid mercenaries coming across the border and they're coming in and kill coalition troops. So our job was to hunt them down. They would come across a platoon strength with machine guns, RPGs, and they would take a house and uh, kill the adults and rape all the kids. I mean, that's, that's what they did, and then kill the kids. And so, but we didn't know this early in the rotation until one night we called them before they could do all that and then killed them all. It's one of those missions, and these guys rolled across the border. They were getting close to a house, and they put a couple guys out into an area. So we come in, they start firing at us on little birds. I go and I look around the side of this mud hut that's there and I can see where they're saying he's at and so I'm watching where they're saying he's at and then I see movement he steps out of the like a doorway of this mud hut with a PKM and he's firing 
and he's got the belt over his hand and he just looks like Rambo. I remember, you know, almost like he's 20 yards. So I come up to shoot at him and he and a round hits me through the chest, you know, right above my plate, you know, so I, it drops his arm and and, and I'm, now I'm taking a lot of rounds. So I just dive in this hole of water that's right there, you know, so I'm under the water and I'm just like, oh man, you know, son of a gun. And the and first thing I, I thought was, man, I think, All right, I guess God, this is probably it, you know, so you know, take care of my family. You know, that's that's what I'm, you know. But then I'm like, man, that's gonna ruin my bow season if I make it, you know, cause, you know, <laughs> I know my arm's paralyzed, you know, I can't move it, you know, and I'm all jacked up. Anyway, they end up capturing the guy outside the gate. And I sit there for a while in that water, just waiting on him to come back, you know. And cause everybody's just like, they think I'm dead. You know, everybody, uh, the guy that was with me, just like he goes, dude, I thought I saw him shoot your head off. So I went up to a new guy. I'm like, hey, man, I said, I've been shot. I need you to help me out here, you know. And he's like, where? And I'm like, right here, you know. And he's like, oh, man. And so he's, he's like, okay, you're not bleeding too bad here. And he goes around the back, and he's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, what? <laughs> he goes, you got a huge hole in your back. And I'm like, well, put something in it. And I end up uh, walking out to the helicopter, got on a helicopter, and flew out. So... You really look at the world like it's a gift. Every day's a gift. I mean, honestly. I mean, you don't survive getting shot with a Peking, to be honest with you. So I retired uh, from the military in 2013, and I, I started doing contract work. I had a chance. Uh, my son, he actually got to come up, and we did a few missions together. I was super proud of him, and I, I was, I was, it was fun to do. Uh, every minute I was thinking that something could happen and, and that would be it. And, you know, and I, I pushed him toward college and, you know, I uh, heard college is awesome, you know. <laughs> and, and I totally pushed him that way and he decided that he wanted to go this route. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm a proud father. It's kind of what you do around here. I started when I was uh, young. My uncle, uh, he would come down and he would uh, hunt like every weekend, you know. And so I would see him when he would come and he would hunt the mountain behind our house. And so, and then once I did it a couple times, that's all I wanted to do was hunt, trap, fish. From when they were small, I mean, very small, I'd take my kids almost on everything I would do. You know, they would they trap with me, they would hunt with me, they fish with me, whatever I was doing. Now they're older, you know, and now I have grandkids, and so I get to worry about uh, getting them ready. If you don't pass it down, what's the use? So I, I really look forward to passing it on to the next generation. I work with several organizations, uh, one of them being Wounded Warrior Outdoors, and that really is uh, healing for me as well as it is the, the other Wounded Warriors to go and just volunteer and help those guys because 22 veterans a day commit suicide, and so if we can keep one of them from doing that, you know, it's a blessing to us, and it's just a calling I feel like I have right now. I also work with a, a couple organizations that do child rescues all over the world. We'll get a call sometimes and, and you gotta go and deal with bad people and so that's a good way to have to get that aggression out, you know, that we still have. I mean, I'm, I'm getting older, you know, but still, you still wanna go do some good in this world and so I feel like uh, that's about as good a stuff as you can do is to rescuing kids. Our generation has to be the ones that step up and say, hey, look, I'm gonna be a person that gives and dedicates my time and energy to helping other folks. Well, sacrifice means to me that you're agreeing to do something that you probably had rather be doing something else at this moment, you know, but you agree to go anyway. People that go and work in a factory all day long and they come home and they don't pursue their dreams because they've got a family and they're actually having to make a living and support their families and all that. To me, that's kind of like my dad, he did that. And that's a huge sacrifice to that, put everything on hold because of your family. It's worth sacrificing for each other. 